It really stows the, the seed to forest and what it takes, um, both in terms of water and, and, and effort and, and commitment. Um, all right, so um, I'm gonna invite John and, and uh, Daryl down to join us. And Mark Harris will be joining us via Zoom. Um, I'm Alice Madden. I'm the director of the Getches Wilkinson Center. I'm going to moderate this next panel, uh, Raising Historically Underrepresented Voices in the Negotiations. Um, John Siren is from Western Resource Advocates. Um, he and his uh, uh, compadre, John Bergen, really um, were so generous in their time when our water fellows started, Jaime Garcia and Chelsea Cohen. They did a series of um, webinars with the three of us uh, to bring uh, Jaime and Chelsea up to speed on Western water law, way above and beyond friendship. That was just, just really terrific. Um, Daryl V. Hill spoke yesterday, um, so you heard him a little bit then, but as a reminder, he's the water manager for the Hickory uh, Apache Nation. And Mark Harris is a general manager for Grand Valley Water Users Association. So if we are all set, I think John was going to go first and you have slides, right? I have a few slides. All right. And then I, I think Mark, there he is. Perfect timing. <laughs> and I don't know if you heard that, Mark, but John's going to go first. Uh, just leave it there. Just leave it there? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I just hit that in the advance, right? Yeah, sure. I think I need to have it in slide mode, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Sorry, my bad. Uh, oh, I was, I was supposed to be surprised. <laughs> um, excuse me? Go ahead. Sure. Hi, my name is John Siren. I'm from Western Resource Advocates. And uh, I want to thank Alice for letting me be here today. And what I understand we're talking on today is, is uh, participation in the Colorado River negotiations and, and deciding the future of the Colorado River. And really the question is, is about underrepresented voices, why we haven't been there, why we, uh, what we can add to the table, and, uh, and how we, that might be addressed in the future. But um, one thing Alice asked me is to keep this very short because she wanted there to be time for questions. So uh, Alice, I hope you, um, I hope you uh, uh, took me at the, uh, I took you at the, I'm taking you at your word is what I'm trying to say because I wanna keep this real short. Um, but I wanted to, since it's gonna be short, what I wanted to do is answer the one question at least that you guys probably all have here as you're watching the presentation. And I, I've been at a lot of these conferences, so there's usually one question that I have for every presenter when they start, their, when they start giving their presentation. So I know it's this question, who is this guy and why is he here? So uh, how I'm gonna start is maybe by answering that question. So who is this guy? I am a former CU Law student, all you other CU Law students, and uh, I was right here 30 years ago. Actually, it would have been right there because it was the old building that was falling apart. And um, uh, so I, I started here, and uh, then I was a judicial, judicial clerk for a while. Uh, then I worked at the uh, assistant attorney, as an assistant attorney general at the uh, the Colorado Attorney General's Office, where I was in charge of the uh, not a, the Colorado River Unit, and we participated in the 2006-2007 negotiations uh, regarding the Colorado River, which uh, sort of resulted in the famous Seven States Agreement, and it was the first time that really the states had really worked together to come up with a different system for administering the uh, the Colorado River. Um, where we, we all gave up a little bit, but we made it work. And so that was, uh, for me, an, an important part of my, my history. Then I actually worked, worked as a water referee for a while, and then as a private attorney for uh, farmers and ditch companies and small towns in Colorado, which also was, uh, for me, stimulating because you're working with the people that affected by these big water decisions. And I gotta say, one thing I've learned from that is that all these people, uh, we may have had different political or whatever types of views, but they're really decent human beings. And if I was in their situation, I would be, 
I would be make, hard, having to make really hard choices too. So that for me was important. Anyway, after doing all that and after working at a, uh, as a private attorney where what at stake was like four to eight acre feet maybe for an, uh, for an individual water user, um, I wanted to go back to where what we're talking about is 11 and a half million acre feet every year and try to, uh, w because where we're at is, as everybody's heard over this, uh, this um, presentations, the, we're at a place where uh, the Colorado River um, is in crisis. We, we know that we're, we're already down several million acre feet from what we expected, or at least over the last 20 years, and we know it's going to get worse. So these negotiations are incredibly important. So who is WRA? We're an organization. Uh, it actually started right across the street um, in, the, in this kind of ramshackle building uh, a little more than 30 years ago. And uh, I, remember, I remember it being there when I was here at uh, CU Law. And we're still in that building, but we're also in a, a number of other buildings in Arizona and in Denver and in Utah, trying to, to think about all the really issues that come up in the Colorado Rat West and specifically for today, the Colorado River Basin. We have sort of uh, uh, experts in a lot of different areas, including uh, in, in water resource, water resource conservation and uh, in water law. Um, but what we're trying to do is think about what's a sustainable future for the West. And what does that actually mean? Well, here's some of the things we're doing. Um, I'm personally working on recreation to, I mean, excuse me, legislation to protect recreational use in waters because it, it's a huge part of our communities, of our towns, of our economies. It's also important to getting water in the river. So I have this I have formulated this uh, uh, personal to me um, vision of how we're going to protect the Colorado River. And it's, in, in a, uh, it's a little complicated, but I'm going to go into it right now. My vision is this. One, we take less water out of the river. And then number two, the water that we don't take out, we keep in there. So there's really two things we need to do. Take less water out and figure out a way to keep in it. In the, in the river. And one of that pieces is recognizing the value that water just being in the river gives us. Uh, our water rights law tends to reward taking water out of the river and doing something with it. Well, what about the fact that the river goes right by the small town and people fish on it and after they fish, they sit in the local communities. Uh, this is all important issues that, that I think we need to discuss. We also are providing assistance with uh, uh, municipal and other conservation efforts. We're uh, doing education and in some, uh, sometimes litigation to promote conservation uh, as a solution on the river over just putting more straws um, in, our, in our water supplies. We're also trying to help with headwater restoration and in developing demand management programs, which you may or may not have heard about over this, this time period. So why should we be in these negotiations? So these negotiations involve, as you can see, the Colorado River Basin. And you can see that it, it doesn't only just involve that picture, but let's make it another half an inch along the entire outside because there's other areas that are served by this water that are outside the basin itself. Well, this is the south, uh, excuse me, uh, southwest. This is where our members live. This is where we are. And our members are, are, are the Southwest. Uh, we are part of the voices that should be heard when we think about what's going to happen here. What's going to happen? Because it's not just about who's going to get water. It's, it's about how that's going to affect the economies out here. It's about how it's going to affect our environment. So we all, we are an organization organized because we need a voice in deciding what's going to happen to this huge part of the West. Um, so why should we be here? I think in these negotiations, what we're hoping to, to work on, and I'm not going to get into real detail here, but is obviously environmental protection. Um, ideas where we can perhaps by uh, using our reservoirs differently, we can make releases in such way that protect parts of our environment. As uh, a previous presenter said, uh, the environment doesn't fix itself. We have to be there and we have to 
we have to consider it in the negotiations and in the discussions. As uh, Jennifer Pitts said, uh, equity is often not a value that people are pushing for. So there should be somebody who kind of speaks for the trees, speaks for, but it's not just the trees, it's the communities along them. These communities want rivers um, that flow by them, that make their places a, a, a place you wanna live. Um, and then ultimately what we're looking for is really a better river. Um, it's difficult because the original Colorado River Compact was such a achievement um, just to, to do that between seven states and get an agreement for, for this sort of division of water. And, you know, I don't think it's ever really going to be take, uh, replaced. But what can happen is we can, we can figure out ways to work within it that really work for everybody. Um, uh, and we can interpret in, in ways that let us be more flexible. We can figure out a way that um, the river isn't just about dividing it up between a lower basin and an upper basin, but it's about making the most sensible use out of this river. Now, what does that mean? In some cases, for example, we need to start thinking about our uh, Colorado River reservoirs as not just being individual reservoirs. And we look at the, the uh, numbers on the reservoir and we make releases when we hit certain numbers, but actually as an integrated system that we can use to help us manage the river uh, in its entirety. We can make releases not only uh, based on numbers, but where we know it's gonna help um, certain parts of the, the state the most. So there, and that gets me to sort of a last strength that I think the NGOs have, which is being a little bit back, a little bit meta, a little bit apart from the, 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 the uh, responsibility of getting uh, delivering so much acre feet of water to to our uh, constituency or whatever we're able to say well wait a second let's take a bigger look i'm not saying the other the states uh the course of the tribes the feds don't have that on their mind too but it is something that we've got a, a, a special skill for and i would uh, i would just if you want to ask why should we be here, you could just say, well, Jennifer Pitt is sort of an example, right? She was very uh, instrumental to helping resolve the issues on the, on the Colorado River, on the Mexico Delta. So um, anyway, that's who I am. That's what we're doing. And that's why I think we should be here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Vigil. Is that correct? Or to, to Mark? To Mark okay, Mark. The, the uses the water, takes it down. <laughs> so Mark, take it away. All right. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. And it is a pleasure to be here. I appreciate uh, the opportunity and thanks for Alice and everyone there uh, for making this remote connection possible today. So a few introductory comments to set up the uh, conversation for a little bit later. Um, I'm gonna start with something that I had to ask myself when I first uh, saw the, the goals uh, some of you, as I had to, probably question whether agriculture has indeed been an underrepresented uh, river policy uh, partner in discussions in the past. And I recognize that it, it uh, that agriculture, in some cases, if not many cases, has been the, has been the beneficiary of the lack of transparency and the inequity that has certainly been a part of uh, historical Colorado River policy negotiations. But that position. Uh, of accommodation and power enjoyed by agriculture in past negotiations can no longer be taken for granted by the ag water community. And I believe that agriculture's potential complacency in these negotiations um, and the potential for uninformed or ill-considered, unwise, unproductive demands that may be put upon agricultural water users by our negotiating partners uh, require that agriculture guard against becoming underrepresented in these negotiations. So what makes us different than uh, the usual parties at the table? Well, the Grand Valley Water Users recognizes that we are but a drop in the bucket and a small one. Uh, we're an example of the very many small pieces of the overall ag water community. And although uh, we currently have the luxury of reasonably well-considered and timely direction, from the board I serve to monitor and participate in these ongoing um, discussions related to the Colorado River. And in spite of significant support from state, 
uh, regional and national water interests, we have very few avenues to, to identify, fund, and sustain such involvement. We won't be at the so-called table, that is the place, the vehicle, the venue where water policy decisions will be made. I give Colorado's representatives uh, in those discussions and at the tables that as they exist now all due credit and our greatest appreciation. They've kept us in the loop. They have inquired of us and listened to our voice and we trust them to do the best job they can under incredibly difficult circumstances. But they do have many voices to consider. They cannot be an aggressive advocate for one constituency only. I submit that appropriately, many of the underrepresented voices in the basin will have uh, an expanded voice at the table and be included again, as has been inappropriately missing in the past. But the Grand Valley water users will have no seat at that small table. When the final questions of policy and equity are made, we won't be there and no one like us will be there. And what would be missing uh, from that negotiation if folks like us aren't? Well, our organization and many of those like us, uh, our members, our customers, our stockholders, and many of the parties we serve have a unique position to add credible practical expertise, experience, and willingness to find sustainable and productive ways to address the increasingly difficult problems and challenges of the Colorado River and its tributaries. These organizations and operations manage the majority of the water in the West, and we won't have direct representation at the small table making those final decisions regarding the future management of the river, but we can inform and support those who will be at that small table to consider our best interests in the social, civic, and economic communities in which we play such important parts. So we would hope to help those at the table to make the best decisions they can and maybe make those decisions more palatable to those currently using over 80% of the consumptive use in the basin. To do that effectively, I would suggest that such involvement needs to be widespread in the agricultural community and amongst those partners. Ag operations and, and organizations need to explore ways to pay continued attention to the broader discussion. They need to be involved if they can or support those who can represent their interests in the broader discussions. Maybe most importantly, we would suggest that they need to initiate the tough, unpleasant, and uncomfortable internal conversations required to identify and evaluate their current liabilities, concerns, obligations, as well as their potential advantages and opportunities regarding water security. And then perhaps when appropriate, look for broader ways to participate with a broader coalition, building those appropriate, effective, credible partnerships that will increase the chances of such voices being heard. And I will stop there. And if Alice or others have questions uh, that have been directed to us then or in the future, we'll take them then. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. All right, Daryl. We, uh, Daryl and I had a short chance to talk about this before, and you know, tribes have been. Um, allegedly invited to the table this time. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, um, but um, <laughs> that's what we, um, you know, we're all waiting to find out. And um, uh, thanks, Daryl, for, for joining this panel. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, hello again to everybody uh, from yesterday. And uh, Hello to, to those who are new here today. Um, just a few opening remarks before I get into the, 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 the panel discussion. You know, I really, really want to acknowledge and, and appreciate the remarks by Terry Fulp this morning. And, and in terms of acknowledging, you know, the, the, the progression of the relationship with the, the federal government and, and the tribal sovereigns in the basin. And I know it probably couldn't have been very easy to sit in those rooms, but Larry and Terry did. Larry Wachowiak and Terry Fulp, you know, when when we realized, you know, with the basin study that, you know, we were not included in that process. And and so they got an earful and they listened and they were willing to listen. And so I'll always be appreciative of that. And uh, and both those individuals are my lifelong friends. And, and, and the individuals who empowered that during that time, you know, were uh, again, my friends today, you know, uh, and, and Ann Castle and Mike Connor. 
you know, uh, they, they set the groundwork for, you know, recognition of tribal water rights in the basin through the tribal water study. And yeah, and they got that maybe it was an oversight and, 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 and a huge oversight, but the one that they corrected real quickly to the best of their ability. So I really appreciate that. I really appreciate, you know, uh, uh, Secretary Vilasak's comments yesterday and just the recognition that, you know, the 30 tribal sovereigns in the basin for the most part are farmers as well. And we've been in, in agricultural activity for thousands of years. And if you heard from the young man from Hopi yesterday, still doing it today. Um, and so I appreciated those comments. And then with uh, Assistant Secretary uh, uh, for Water and Science, Tanya Trujillo, I was very, you know, again, you know, a personal friend of mine. And, and I'm, I'm glad to call her my friend. And uh, done a lot of work together in the Colorado River Basin. But one of the things she said today was an acknowledgement of the creation of some flexible tools and an acknowledgement maybe the limits of current legal and policy structure and how maybe we can work to, to start to imagine uh, some, some progress outside of that structure. So thank you uh, for letting me share that to begin with. Um, and, and I think, you know, to begin with, uh, Michelle Brown Yazzie from the Navajo Nation was supposed to be here today. And so I get to, to fill her Navajo shoes a little bit today. And uh, Michelle is also my friend. She's the assistant uh, uh, attorney general at Navajo and really starting to get involved in a lot of these Colorado uh, uh, River uh, um, uh, water rights issues. So you'll probably be hearing more of her name in the future. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about this topic and, and, and when Alice and I were, were talking about this, you know, and, and her concerns about maybe being uh, uh, disrespectful and, and having tribal representation on this panel. And I, I assured her that it's, it's, it's probably really, really appropriate, but, you know, progress has been made. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that, you know, that when I was thinking about this is, you know, just the transition of thought, you know, we've heard, you know, uh, 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 about the, you know, kind of the, the sovereigns that are involved in the policy making process and, and, you know, with, with the United States, Mexico and the seven basin state sovereigns. Well, there are 30 other sovereigns in the basin and, uh, and they're not stakeholders, they're sovereigns. You know, we get invited to a whole lot of conversations as a stakeholder. And uh, I think it's very important to recognize that, that the difference, and I think that that's changing, the climate is changing, pun intended. Um, mm -hmm. um, and yesterday's comments, I just need to acknowledge this in my list of stuff here, that President Nez said, I think it was something that was really, really touching to me uh, because, uh, of, of what he said in terms of fulfillment of tribal commitment. And, and, and he was talking to about that in regards to Navajo code talkers and the many Navajos who've served within the armed forces. And, and, and I just wanted to acknowledge that because, you know, my four uncles on my mom, mom's side served in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the military. And so did my, my grandfather was in World War II. So yes, you know, we fulfilled on our commitment to, to, pr to prove that we, you know, like we had to prove, but our commitment to, you know, how we, we feel that this country, what this country means to us. And I thought that was very, very positive. Um, and I can't help but go back a little bit and acknowledge Jennifer Pett as well. You know, I don't know, five years ago, I, I, I didn't know anything too much about the Colorado River Basin. And I was invited to the Latino Eco Festival in Denver. And that was about five years ago. And that was the first time I got to see the pulse flow. And I got to see the magic that happens when water comes back to a community. And, you know, it, it made me cry because it was just so touching, you know, to see what water can do. And then I got to know who Jennifer Pitt was and the commitment that she had from the NGO side. So forever be thankful for that because in the beginning, long time ago, it was like, well, we need a native and well, Ask Daryl. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I showed up to a whole lot of these things, you know, maybe not as informed as I could be, but I really, you know, took it seriously in terms of, you know, the honor and that, that, that's bestowed on me that I get to speak and that water allows me to sp speak on its behalf. So I'll always be grateful for that. Um, and, and so I was introduced at that Latino Eco Festival to some fascinating statistics. And being a Native American and an indigenous person in the Colorado River Basin, um, we've come to know uh, who, who those other 
rep- underrepresented voices are as well, being one. And so at that conference, I got to learn that, you know, 33% of the Colorado River Basin is Latino. And so when we talk about underrepresented voices and at that particular uh, uh, conference, too, I got to see a young Kokopa man uh, who was a bird singer for his tribe on the Kokopa tribe on the Mexico side. And I was deeply, deeply moved. So, so what, you know, to the, to the point that I, I, I went to Kokopa on the Mexico side and I got to see, you know, where the Kokopas live and to see the Harvey River. And as was mentioned before by my Mexican friend that, you know, they used to be fishermen. And you can see these boats like 100 feet from where the river used to be. And so, uh, you know, definitely an international component and an, an international indigenous component to this conversation, too, and those underrepresented voices as well. And, um, and, and, and so you go to the United States side of that, you know, the Cocopas that are in Yuma, it's been mentioned before. And, you know, in, in 2012, the Ten Tribes Partnership got to, to host the Colorado River Water Users Association. And it was the first time anybody had really used media in terms of a, a visuals, a film, to kind of highlight, you know, this is who we are. And so one of the things that stuck out to me the most that, about that, that film that we produced with uh, Nano Becker, who's Bitta Becker's sister, who's a filmmaker, was the Kokopa uh, a cultural director, you know, talked about who they were as a people. Their life is given by the river. They come, come from the river. They go back to the river. Their life is given by the river. And then the, the camera pans out to the river and there is no river. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that, 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 that just, in my mind, you know, it's like, you know, you, you, this is not only taking into supply, demand, structural deficit issues. This is taking into account, you know, the very essence of who people are and an ability to be who they are. And so when I was thinking about, you know, why should we be included or why do, why, why do we need to be included in this or, or how should we be included in this? You know, one of the things that comes to mind is, you know, or, or how should we be? And we've, we fought really hard at, you know, starting with the 10 Tries Partnership 10 years ago, just to get to, 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 to have people have a basic understanding of, of tribal water rights and how they work and how we fit into the system. And in order to do that, you know, we created a vision statement and, that, and, a, and a mission related mission statement. And it was about, you know, the, and basically the vision statement was that we will lead from a spiritual mandate to make sure this river is always protected protected for all living creatures and the land and the homelands of tribes in the basin. Pretty powerful. And how are we going to do that? We're going to communicate, we're going to collaborate, and we're going to educate. And we've been trying to do that for the last 10 years to the best of our ability through a numerous amount of conversations and, and grateful for the, the partnerships and the friendships and, and that we've established over that period of time. But I think, you know, part of that process is that, you know, that we're looking for is inclusion, just basic, basic inclusion. You heard me talk a little bit about that yesterday. And part of that inclusion, what does that include? <laughs> a respect and an acknowledgement of tribal sovereignty and the, and the ability to be self-determined in the exercise of that sovereignty. And so when we're talking about policy in the Colorado River, um, I can't help but think of uh, Chairman Tim Williams from the Fort Mojave tribe because he's like, you know, table, we're still looking for that table. We can't find the table. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, uh, we're getting close. Um, and so when we think about things that, you know, why the, the other thing, components of the, the renegotiation process that, that I've heard are, are, are important to not only tribes, but, you know, non-tribal folks as well, is we talked about it yesterday, the universal access to clean water, whether a tribe has a settlement or not. Um, and, and what does that do? You know, in terms of, you know, and, and John Echohawk, you know, is, is a, has done incredible work in ensuring that the settlement process continues. And, that, um, and that's something that would, needs to continue. And again, why? You know, to, for certainty. You know, we talked, heard a lot about that. 
if we can understand how future reserve water rights and senior water rights of tribes fit into this, then it'll create more certainty and I absolutely believe it'll facilitate the process. The inclusion of cultural, traditional and spiritual values into this process that really isn't part of the current structure. There's no place to put that. Um, the environment, ecosystems, and the protection of land. And we've heard a lot about that. All of these are inherent to in the indigenous DNA uh, of who we are. Um, and, and of course, you know, uh, science and technology. You know, we've got some of the best science in the world that, that happens in the Colorado River Basin. And as Brad Udall talked about this morning, you know, we keep trying to look, bombard people with the facts, but, you know, the unwillingness to accept the facts. So how is it that we can, you know, uh, uh, step out of the delusion of the, the, the policy structure that we have and, and, and hopefully into the reality that, that's been ex expressed to us from the science uh, folks that, that have spoken the last few days? And I, I, I can't help by talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, underrepresented voices, you know, and, and, you know, you take, for instance, one of the largest ad allocations is, you know, to, you know, to, to California and metropolitan uh, water district in Southern Cal California provides water to a huge, you know, demographic of African Americans. And then also, you know, through this process of, of being underrepresented and not being included in the process, you know, we, we made relationships with uh, like folks at Imperial Irrigation District as well. And we got to know their specific issues. And absolutely those things like salt and, uh, the salt and sea issues that need to still be resolved today with those migrant farm workers there. And I think, um, you know, uh, one of the questions, and of course, you know, we've heard a lot about the fish and wildlife and the recovery of that. And it just, it, and I was having a conversation with a gentleman in the hallway. It's like, you know, as a Native American, it's like, wow, I understand the environment. I understand the ecology. I understand ecosystems. I understand if you take something out of the ecosystem, that it impacts everything with, with, within that ecosystem. Well, we're part of that ecosystem. And if we don't have these fish and these animals, then we're next. And I, I'm not sure how we connect those dots. Um, and then, you know, one of the questions that was asked was, you know, what does success look like, you know, in, in, in this? And, and I can't help but think back again about Water and Tribes initiatives toward the Census of the Basin document, you know, and everybody that we spoke to, almost universally, everybody said they want to see a healthy, sustainable, living Colorado River. I mean, I mean that's what you said. And then I can't help but think, you know, go back to what does success mean? You know, and I think about, you know, the Ten Tribes Partnership in terms of, you know, leading from that spiritual mandate, you know, and, and, and again, you know, so we've heard a lot about sustainability and resiliency and, you know, the inclusion of, of who we are as a people definitely, I think, can inform and guide, you know, the process as it moves forward. So we can't offer that unless we have a place to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so the idea for this panel, uh, which each speaker did so well, I, I sent them out a series of questions. Um, and Mark, I want to make sure, yeah, here you go. You're brought back up. Um, and they did a great job of, of addressing those. And obviously we have sort of one NGO voice here, one water user ag voice here, and one tribal voice here. So for folks in the audience, um, you know, we'll have time for discussion. So if there's anyone who wants to add your own voice, please, please do. Um, and, and don't feel like you just have to add a question, but we'd love to know how you think your organization might be more impactful. Um, but I'll, I'll start uh, with a question back to Mark. Um, I guess, and I think you, you, you did a great job. I, I could tell you looked at each question and answered it. So I really appreciate that. But I'll ask, um, what advice would you give to others, you know, in, you know, similar water users of how to raise their voice? Um, it seemed, you know, I, I know a lot of people know you. Um, you're well-respected. You have a, you know, a somewhat high profile. How would you advise others to, um, to raise the profile of their own voices? Well, therein lies a, a lot of the challenge. Uh, as many potentially underrepresented voices in this discussion is 
you know, we're a, we're a diverse group. I remember uh, uh, Daryl saying a couple of years ago, he said asking for one voice from the tribes is unfair. And I've, I, that's resonated with me since that one voice from agriculture is somewhat unfair. Yeah. But uh, as a friend of mine on the Western Slope says, he said, how do we get to these folks that don't go to meetings? And I've come to believe that you don't is that we have to find ways and take the initiative to reach out uh, to, to uh, folks that are uh, operators, members of organizations, and find ways to go to them, and sometimes using ex existing organizational ties to do that, because folks are not gonna come for a variety of, of reasons. It's so, just so much easier not to, even if folks want to. Um, we've begun to uh, carry on some individual, private, confidential uh, conversations with people that are uh, friends and associates and folks in some cases that we have no relationship with, but it's a challenge. Uh, we've had the luxury of, a, of an awful lot of good fortune uh, at the Grand Valley Water Users. We have a highly developed system. We have a great operations manager uh, who, who without him, all of this good stuff that I get to spend my time on all stops. So I think that's a challenge. I don't have an answer yet, we have spent a lot of time the last two or three years, maybe five years, with the support of many people that are in your audience today to do exactly that is to try to find ways to reach out to folks on the ditch bank. Um, and we've come a long ways with the, with the, the awareness part. Uh, we've avoided a lot of the issues that, that, that Brad Udall uh, makes it impossible for me to sleep even in the afternoons now about what's coming down the road. <laughs> but we see it, and we see it happening on the river. We see it happening in the ditch. So we're trying to go that next step from awareness to recognizing that there are multiple voices that are appropriately involved. There's going to be some pain for all of us. We need to figure out what that is. So it's a good question. I have no answer yet. <laughs> Uh, John, I'll, I'll turn to you. Um, WRA is, you know, a strong voice in the region. You, you guys do your job well. Um, how, what advice would you give to other NGOs or maybe grassroots groups about how to um, be able to get their ideas and uh, the elements that they think are important um, in the outcomes of these negotiations? How, what advice would you give to them? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I think something that uh, Mark just said really resonated, which is um, using connections, reaching out, trying to make those connections. But um, I also recently spoke to uh, an environmental attorney that uh, had been involved in the 2006-2007 negotiations on behalf of, I, I had worked on that on behalf of the state. Um, and I asked him how, um, I think their voice was less heard at that time. And they said, what did you do to really get your voice heard? And what he did say is you really do need to work behind the scenes, try to make connections with people, and then you need to advance ideas. So one thing they did do is release a number of different papers on, on how, uh, what, how, what interests are shared and how there could be solutions that help bring those together. So it is really about trying to get some ideas out there and trying to uh, talk to people who can, who can possibly be receptive to it. Um, Daryl, I actually, I'm embarrassed that someone quizzed us yesterday how many tribes um, were in the Colorado River Basin. I said 29 and there's 30. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and again, you're one, one, one person um, who certainly cannot represent um, e even your own tribe as we, as we know. But I'm curious, you, you know, you do know a lot of people. Um, one thing we hear constantly is that differing level of capacity among tribes. I mean, there's, there's wealthier tribes that have strong voices and there's other tribes of those 30 that maybe no one's ever heard of or met anyone from. So what, what advice do you have and how do you keep people's hopes up um, too that they, that they do have a chance of being heard? If that's even true. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah. That's an interesting question, and, and you know, and yeah, there are thirty tribal sovereigns in the basin, and uh, and each one at different levels in terms of where their water policy, water management, water infrastructure are. As, as you heard yesterday, with a lot of the universal access to clean water conversation, uh, it, it's, it's it just really varies in terms of you know, and and, and so through the Water and Tribes Initiative. 
uh, twofold agenda help to increase in, 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 uh, tribal capacity and, and build on the collaborative effort. That's something that's been uh, at the heart of, of what that, that particular conversation is, is to, to make sure that the 30 tribal sovereigns at a very minimum are informed about you know, what is happening you know, in terms of the policy of the Colorado River and now starting to imagine, you know, creating a, a, a process where, because of the relationships that have been established over time, you know, hopefully some mechanisms to provide the, and fill those capacity gaps, you know, where they exist. And so uh, the, the goal being not to, to, to be prescriptive or to build consensus of, of, in, in any direction, but to provide that so that tribal sovereign, again, can be self-determined in, in terms of you know, how they want to participate or not to participate, but making sure that they have the knowledge, the information, and the resources to, to maybe responsibly do that, for whatever that looks like for their individual tribes. And, 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 and part of, because uh, uh, again, you have to understand the context of, again, the, you know, the fact that the United States, Mexico, seven basin states, and you, know, and you look at the different levels of governance within each one of those structures, and then you add to the mixed tribal water rights, uh, quantified, unquantified, lower basin, upper basin, um, you know, it gets pretty complex. And uh, you know, being a hundred years behind the game, there's some a lot of catch up to do, and I think there's an, sometimes an expectation, you know, from uh, most water users and, and and those sovereigns in the basin that we're just supposed to know, and 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 the de the default that uh, I've said this before is that. Uh, the default can't be that the state sovereign and federal sovereign speak on behalf of an individual tribe's water rights. They shouldn't and they can't. And so uh, again, it goes back to just full circle again, no matter what we're, we're talking about, it's about creating that place for us to engage in the policy making process. And I know um, our last um, panel today, uh, time to get real, there's going to be a little bit of discussion about the unadjudicated water rights that tribes hold and how, how do we um, say that we're pl you know, planning for the future if, if we're not um, addressing the reality of, of, of those potential rights. Um, I'd love to, if, if there's anyone else um, that would like to make some comments, you know, it strikes me here we're at a law school, we have um, practitioners, we have scientists, we have researchers, academics, um, who have important voices as well. And if there's anyone who's working um, or, or advising or connecting with folks that are involved with the negotiations, I think others would be thrilled to, if, if any of you feel comfortable um, talking about your experiences, that would be great. Or of course, just asking questions, so. I have a couple more questions until someone raises their hand, but um, Mark, I'll go back to you. What, what does success look like? 2026 guidelines are written. What does success look like? Well, uh, it'll probably be, probably some of us won't be around when we ultimately determine whether we've been successful in these things or not. But I think just from a, from a fairly pedestrian perspective, finding the right interim balance of these competing needs would be a huge success. Uh, it will evolve. There will continue to be shortages and problems. Um, but from a more mercenary perspective, I think a, a balance that includes uh, water conservation that's beneficial to agriculture uh, in whatever area of agriculture you're in, uh, however you farm. And only by accomplishing that goal uh, do we believe that we can achieve our long-term success, and that is to continue to provide the opportunity for subsequent generations to be involved in agricultural enterprise. And that involves both land and water. So working towards that end would be a success to us. Um, you know, the other thing um, that's come up over and over again is um, I, I was a former legislator and I always hated things that sunsetted. It was like, God, we went through that battle. Why do we have to come back to it in three years? Please, God, no. But this is so important that these sunset and, you know, these discussions now might not even be reality in a year or two. So I'm curious, too, what people's thoughts are about how do we make guidelines that can evolve in real time, because that's really what it's going to take. Um, so I'm curious if, if either, if, if John or others in the audience or, or Daryl have 
um, have comments about that, the negotiations themselves. And I know um, some folks might not feel like they, they are, you know, well enough informed on, on how this is going to turn out. But gosh, you know, climate change used to be described as a, a slow moving train wreck. And that's why it was so hard to respond to. Well, it's no longer slow moving. It's still a train wreck. Um, and, you know, we're, we're still not responding. Well, there's a sort of a first step, which is maybe this is like a first step in an uh, alcoholics and non anonymous group or something, which is you got you to face the truth, right? We have to <laughs> sit back and, and see what we're actually dealing with and, and what. And I think unless we do that, we're just not. Well, first of all, unless we do that, um, we're going to have to renegotiate them. I mean, we're going to have to keep adjusting them because they're not going to work. So I think that's the first start. We need to have a, a framework in which. We're, we're forecasting water uh, water availabilities, excuse me, um, accurately, and so that we can work within that framework. And then I think um, there's been, been dis different provisions about, I mean, discussions about how do we um, how do we adapt to climate change. And I do think that at some point it's going to be all the different players, uh, you know, as, as Jennifer said, there's no equity, but at some point, if we're going to survive, we're all going to have to cut back. That's it. And then within that framework, um, I think um, we need to have a more flexible system that, uh, uh, excuse me, allocates water somewhat proportionally of, as to what's available. So in other words, we need real-time projections of, as to what's available, not simply relying on reservoir levels, but looking at snowpack, looking at um, uh, river forecasts, looking at what we're likely to have today and over the next five years, and then we make our allocation decisions based on what's in the river, what's likely to be in the river. Um, you know, I could go on for a while, but those are just some basic ideas that I think we have to we have to start trying to incorporate into the conversation. Daryl? Yeah, yeah, I can't help but think of uh, something my friend Becky Mitchell uh, talks about, and I think it's 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 so so valid in terms of you know that what what is this what is this going to take, and uh, she talks about changing cultures and behavior and having a policy have having having policy that empowers that changing of culture and behavior, and and in in specifically in in in, in the regard of, of of having less water in the future, and what that's going to look like, and and how we're going to decide to be as human beings. And I think you know the other component too is uh, uh, indigenous folks have been practicing adaptive management in the basin for basin for thousands of years, and I think you know part of that is just an acceptance of you know what is going on, and I think there's a lot of resistance to what's going on instead of an acceptance of it, and so when we start to think of the environment as well looking at that realistically as well in terms of what does that really look like and not what we want a romanticized view of what it should look like. And so I think those are, are things and how do we change cultures and behavior and how do we create po policy that will empower that and how can we create policy that's going to be dynamic. You know, I think that's part of the you know problem with the current structure of policy is that it wasn't, it was, it's not dynamic and it wasn't inclusive. And if you include those dynamics, that sounds like a good start. Um, I'd love to open it up for any comments or, or questions from the audience. Alice, we have a question you came through on chat. Oh, good. And you can, uh, you're probably the only one who can see the chat. So feel free okay. to. <laughs> I think it's from, if I get the name right, Lisa Buchanan, is that correct? Is she waving her hand or is she remote? I think she's remote. Yeah, most okay. of our audience is remote. So. All right. Had a couple of questions. Uh, one of those was, does the Colorado River District uh, represent ag interest? And they absolutely positively do. Uh, it's a part of their mission to, to protect Western Colorado agriculture. Absolutely. Um, and we respect that and we support that and participate in that. Um, my point is, is that, again, they have a, a very eclectic constituency. That they have responsibilities to. And there are times, although our agendas are very similar, that they're not exactly the same. And there will be times where we may feel that we need to represent our own interests, for example, uh, in a respectful and productive way. So we wanna give them all due credit, absolutely. The second part of that question was, uh, how would ag view a percentage, um, 
uh, combination somehow or another. I think it kind of is, is going to what John may have been saying. Um, and I think that in, in many uh, cases, um, and you know, it, it is almost instantaneous death at the coffee shop to speak for agriculture. So I, will, I don't wanna speak for agriculture, but I think that many producers certainly understand that there's going to have to be some way to, uh, in, in a broader context that we probably don't understand yet, to share somehow in a proportionate way. And whether that's in demand management kinds of things that John was talking about, whether they be temporary, compensated, and voluntary, but that there is a growing conversation, at least amongst many of the people that we've visited with, um, that in, in, in the interest of all agriculture and for the state of Colorado and the entire basin is that, yes, some rational, reasonable approach to ways to share in that obligation are going to have to be part of it. Uh, it, it they're just it, with a scarce, a growingly and scarce resource. It has to happen. And it is uh, to our detriment if we don't recognize that now. So the answer, uh, Lisa, is I think whether we like it or not, the answer is yes. Uh, so we just have about two or three more minutes. Any comments or questions from in this room? I have a quick comment. Sure, you're allowed. Uh, well, I wanted to just mention that I really enjoy listening to Mark and Daniel and listening to, to the concerns of their yeah. constituency. And I particularly, particularly like the phrase that uh, Daniel, uh, Daryl, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Daryl turned that um, uh, stuck with me, which is I, I am honored that the river has allowed me to speak on its behalf. And um, I really like that phrase because for me, the river, I think, and I think for all of us, isn't just how much water is in it and how it can be divided up. It means something a lot more to Mark and, and the agricultural uh, people that he represents, it, it means a whole lot more than that to to uh, Daryl, and it means more to the people that I represent as well. So um, I'm, I'm, I just want to say that's sort of what all of us are doing. We're all getting the opportunity to speak on behalf of the river, and uh, so it is. It is nice to have that opportunity. Daryl, would you have any closing remarks? So. Okay. Um, Mark, is there any, uh, sh you think, short question on the chat that we could j get to before we end? Let me take a quick look. I think that was it. Okay. So thank you for having me. Thank you guys so much. This has been really interesting. <laughs>